Um, by all means, use the chat if for some reason you're not seeing the code that you're supposed to be seeing or there are any other technical issues. Um, I'm gonna wait just 10 or so more seconds. I'm actually broadcasting live on my YouTube channel. Excellent. Okay, let's do this. So here's what the webinar is going to consist of. First, we're gonna look at the history of chatbots and the history of artificial intelligence. After that, we'll look at the growing role of chatbots in 2020, how they are basically playing a bigger and bigger part in our digital economy. After that, we are going to have a hands-on look on about chatbots and AI. So finally, we'll have a Q&A session. So very first, the history of chatbots. Well, I'll take you through this step by step, but letting you know it starts with the Second World War and a cryptographic machine designed to check to, to break the German secret codes called the Bomba. So the Bomba was the first built advanced computing machine. So from there on, uh, Alan Turing conceptualizes computers and we get around to today. So let's, let's actually take this step by step. So in 1940, uh, a big factor in the Allies' victory of the Second World War was the British breaking the German cryptographic code and the work of a British mathematician called Alan Turing that perfected this machine which basically performed several thousand computations and permutations a second, allowing the British to try thousands of different possible passwords. When the war was over in 1948, Turing came up with an impossible to believe conceptualization of computers. So what he did is basically said that a machine that takes in ones and zeros as input, a series of ones and zeros, um, processes them and puts out a series of ones and zeros based on its own internal rules, would be able to solve pretty much any computational problem. So that as a concept looked like lunacy to most people. Alan Turing was at the time called crazy. However, this is exactly what your computer does. The keyboard, which you hold in your hands right now, every time you press a key, a sequence of ones and zeros that's eight long goes inside. That gets processed. Um, every time you look at an image on your screen, there are about 2 million pixels, each of which has a 64 bit or a 32 bit, depending on your monitor, sequence of ones and zeros that specify the, the pixel colors, red, green, and blue, and the pixel locations. So all your computer really does is take in information with ones and zeros, manipulate it using programs written in ones and zeros, and puts out information in ones and zeros. So take a look at this uh, video about a Turing machine from a YouTube channel called Computer File. Just let me know in the chat if you can actually hear it. I'm gonna make sure that I'll share audio with all attendees. Let me get into the Zoom. Share computer sound. Try that again. If I'm not hearing it. Hmm. Let's try that again. Hmm. No sound. Um, we're going to do, if I escape, play it over here. The way Turing, okay, that works. Turing described these machines. Share, sorry, not share. Present. Try three. 
The way Turing described these machines goes like this. You have a way of writing down information in a coded form. His way was to think of a tape, which is as long as it needs to be. It's divided up into squares. And on each of these squares, there's either a one or a zero, or we can have some spaces. Now, what our machine does is it looks at the tape one square at a time. So you could imagine it as a little box running above the tape, maybe on little wheels, looking one square at a time. And that information codes up a question into or a problem that we want solved. What the Turing machine does is really simple. At any moment in time, it's in a particular state and it's looking at one square on the tape. And it has a log book, a program book, and that tells it if, for instance, you're in state number 23 and you're looking at a zero, then rub out the zero, change it to a one, move one square to the right and move into state number 359 for instance. Or if you're in state number 359 and you're looking at a one, leave that one as it is, move one square to the left, and move into state number 20. Really simple instructions. What the machine does is it starts off with a certain pattern of ones and zeros. It follows these rules one square at a time, transforming that string of one and zeros into a different string of ones and zeros. And eventually, hopefully, the machine moves into a halting state. It's finished, it's done. And what's left on the tape is the answer to our problem, coded up as ones and zeros. That is such a simple process, but it turns out it's the essence of computation. Whatever any computer can do, it could in theory be done by that system looking at ones and zeros on a tape. There you go. I'm glad I got the audio to work on this one. So in 1948, there isn't a computer around. There's nothing close to a general purpose programmable machine. There are machines that can like do maths calculation created by Charles Babbage. There was a machine that could break German codes, but it couldn't do anything else. So in 1948, Turing defines what it would take to do a general uh, problem-solving computer. Nobody thinks it could even be built. Uh, when they initially tried, they used tapes of ones and zeros. But in 1950, already, uh, before we even have computers, Turing basically says that, hey, these computers that we're going to have, because they are eminently buildable, maybe not with the technology we currently have, but all it takes is uh, a, a unit that processes sequences of ones and zeros and puts out sequences of ones and zeros, we're gonna have intelligent computers when we have a computer that passes this test. And the test was called imitation game, otherwise known as a Turing test. So the Turing test works as follows. You basically have a person here, C, that chats with two entities. One of them is human, one of them is a computer. Of course, it doesn't know which is which because it only exchanges text messages. If person C cannot tell, has no level of certainty about whether A is human or B is human, if C is confused, then A has passed the Turing test. So any uh, artificial intelligence that exchanges chat messages with you and you don't know if that, if that is human or not, um, that is an official pass of a Turing test. In terms of where we are today with it, there have been plenty of computers that have done an excess of one minute, but no one has come anywhere close to five minutes of conversation. So that's roughly the state of the Turing test today. Now, in terms of historical progression, in 1980, we saw a game that, well, this game blew everyone's minds for so many reasons. It was called Zork. You could play Zork online. You could play Zork online for free today. And Zork was just a chatbot, a text-based interactive game where the chatbot was essentially leading a game of Dungeons and Dragons. So you would have messages like you be told you're in an open field west of a big white house with a boarded front door. There's a small mailbox. You could open it. You could say, see what's inside. 
what really Zork was for the first time was a text parser where hundreds of different messages could actually get the job done. And people were so enamored with it. As I said, it became the top selling game of the 1980s and launched, I think it was Activision into becoming one of the biggest um, computer, make, computer game making companies in the world. So in the 90s, there was some progress made. There was a competition and today it's been sort of semi-defunded, but it's still running. It's called the Liebner Prize. And in this competition, essentially uh, different companies or individuals would bring forward chatbots and they would attempt to pass a Turing test. And yeah, so far, no, nothing has crossed two minutes. There was one entrant, which wasn't an official entrant, but that uh, pretended to be a 14 year old boy that barely speaks English from Ukraine. That was the only time anybody got past, say, a two minute mark. Now, if you want to chat with a chatbot, I might give you uh, a minute or two. You can actually look at these little bitlies, these little links, and um, you can open up and chat with, with the chatbot, both Mitsuku and Cleverbot, were entrants into the Liebner Prize. Mitsuku, by the way, is a rule-based chatbot. So it's essentially built uh, using just human-made rules, if else statements, lists, databases, whereas Cleverbot is truly an artificial intelligence and Cleverbot um, adapts what it has heard from other people into what it says to people in the future. So um, Cleverbot uses a, a, a more promising technology, but Mitsuku has been more successful in past competitions. In terms of chatbots in 2020, this is what you're going to see chatbots doing. Um, you could get an app uh, from Domino's Pizza, and instead of picking a pizza from a menu, you could describe your dream pizza. I want mozzarella cheese, I want salami, I want prosciutto or whatever toppings you want, pineapple, whatever you want on your pizza, it's actually going to assemble that pizza for you and you're just sort of typing in text, describing a pizza that you like. There are apps that do the same thing for real estate. You describe your dream house and it'll basically tell you what houses are for sale or rent that match your dream house. Um, even if you go on my site right now, there's a sort of pop-up chatbot that asks you if you want to get in touch. I mean, there is um, there, there are many companies that create little chatbots that help customers when they're on company sites. And these are, again, they don't even pretend to be human. They just guide you to the most relevant page and sometimes guide you to the most relevant person on sort of the, the, the company staff. However, the most realistic chatbots out there today are these. You, some of you have one of them. I wonder, like, let me know in the chat if you have a, uh, a Siri or uh, an Amazon Alexa or a Google Assistant. Now, these essentially work the same way as any other chatbots, except there's a module on top that converts text to speech and speech to text. Uh, given that conversion, particularly of speech to text, they're not as accurate in terms of uh, the input of the human into them. But my God, uh, in certain applications, they are becoming mind blowing. So what you're about to see is a, um, this is a, a Google duplex. It's, a, it's an app that you can download in most countries. It's available in the, in the app store for both Android and Apple. And you can use Google duplex to make reservations for you haircut, restaurant, any type of reservations and appointments. And it uses an AI chatbot to, that basically pretends it's human and makes reservations for you. Uh, check it out. And if you can let me know if everything's cool with the audio, that would be good. Ah, come on. Why? All right, at least I think I know how to fix it this time. I need to drag it. Yep. To make you a haircut appointment. To make you a haircut. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google 
to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Oh, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So the next one is another example of the same thing. I just got to do the same trick to make sure that the audio is going to work. Um, Let's be another example. Oh, Let's say you want to. So let's go present. No, come down. Uh, uh. Yeah, close enough. Oops. Maybe another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, Day, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually we need to for like upper like uh, five people. For few, four people you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the 7th. Oh, no, it's not too busy. You, you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I gotcha. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. So, the bottom line is, uh, this is going to be how we make appointments in the future. It's really, really highly effective. And, you know, if I want to hang out with you, maybe my chatbot is going to talk to your chatbot and it'll be saying, mm, yeah, what about 10? Nah, I'm busy. What about 1030? And figure it out among themselves, which, yeah, it's, it's a sort of really strange, bizarre future. Now, um, we're just about going to get into the Python coding. But before we do, I'll tell you a little bit about why Python for chatbots. Well, most of those chatbots you've seen are primarily written in Python. There's several reasons for that. Um, Python has the world's most advanced libraries when it comes to analyzing text. And so, for example, the, the text blob or the NLTK library, which uh, figure out how to break text into sentences, words, uh, engrams, which figure out how to read emotion are all Python-based libraries. And as far as presenting to beginners, well, Python is probably the easiest language to learn and the easiest to understand if you're just looking at it. So typically when I teach classes, I put a Python, a bit of Python code on the screen that the students have never seen in their life. And I ask them to guess what does this code do? And a lot of them can indeed anticipate. So, um, what we're going to be doing in the rest of the webinar is going through this sequence of programs, which is going to culminate in a chatbot that does something quite advanced, that interacts with people and remembers everything they said, 
it has randomness, it has mood, it has memory. So it's actually quite an advanced chatbot. Um, but we're going to start from very, very, very basics. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen here. And I'm going to put a sequence of programs on the screen, hopefully. Yep, yeah, it's right here. So if we Okay, so we're going to start from essentially a, a, almost a Hello World program. I might just delete the code here. You can access my code through this link that's there, or you could basically type in one of the bit.ly's. I'm going to put it in the chat in both um, YouTube and Zoom. So one second, where is the chat? more chat so yeah you can open that link and you can access my code so there it is um that's the code link so you open that at any point you open it you'll just get a mirror of what i have so if we, for example, say, hello, human, what is your name? We can save a variable here as input. So name equals input. And we could print something like jello or hello name. So what this is going to do is going to say, hello, human, what is your name? And if I say Bob, I'll say, hello, Bob. Now. What's a fun thing to do, particularly at starting, is let's manipulate that name a little bit. Let's create a nickname. So to create a nickname, um, we could create a brand new variable, nickname. And nickname could be something like doctor plus name plus and I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of things you can do here, the genius. So right now we've created a brand new variable. We're not using it yet. So if I say Sanyan, I use my name here. It's just going to say, hello, Sanyan. But you could use it in the next statement and say something like, I will call you and use the nickname variable. So let's see some of the people that are currently watching. I'll just use somebody's name. Where, where's my attendee list? 11. Glory. That's a cool name. Glory. Name is Glory. I will call you Dr. Glory, the genius. In fact, I think that being a capital letter would make it a tad better. So what else could you do with this? Um, in class, I leave students with um, a few tricks. For example, that itself uh, can bring up the last letter. So let's say if you have a name that ends in a consonant, like not a vowel, you could do something like this. Name plus name minus one plus Y. So if your name is Bob, I'll call you Bobby. Tom is going to be Tommy. John is going to be Johnny. So these are some these are some sort of tricks that you could do with string manipulation. You can use that to um, uh, take a segment of say the first three characters of a name and go on messing around with it from there. Now. What's, what's the next point? Because this right here is a program that is so basic, it doesn't even use a, a loop or an if statement. It simply takes the user input and manipulates it in some way. So the next point, moving on from this, and uh, I'll send you a link to the second program. Second code. Dum. And the second program just asks a question. 
Ah, do you like computers? You could say yes. And you could say no. However, this deceptively simple program uh, is interesting because if you dig a little deeper, if you try to find what's wrong with it, you'll discover that, well, there's plenty that can be improved. I mean, starting with this, you could do a capital yes. I don't like you go away. Well, I thought that that's a clear answer, isn't it? Um, you can say something like, yes, I love them. And that gives you a negative answer. So one of the first things that you could do to improve it, and by the way, this itself, in, you know, when I teach this tends to be a about 25 minute, half a lesson, you could lowercase this, ants equals to ants dot lower. And what this does is at least it handles the case. So now you could say yes. Mm. If you were to say yes this way, that would work too. But you still have issues. If I say yes, I love them. That is a, an issue. I don't like you go away. The other problem is, um, what you're looking for really isn't only is it yes or something other than yes. You also want to deal with no. So you could copy that and check if the answer is no. And if the answer is no, then you can tell them to go away. Otherwise, otherwise, you could say something like I don't understand. Now, for those of you who have not done programming, um, have a think about what do you think is going to happen when I answer yes? Um, oh, hi, Nikita Sharma. Yes, the recording will be sent to all the attendees on Eventbrite within the week. I'll also send you a YouTube webinar. I may leave it on YouTube, but I'm not sure because there's a few edits that I want to make. But okay, back to the program. What is the problem with this? Most people are going to predict that what happens here is it's going to say, great, we're going to get along. But it'll also say, I don't understand. Which brings you up to why we use ELIFs in programming. So what's really going on is there is a, essentially a journey. And at this point, you ask a question. And you basically say, if yes. Apologies for the horrible writing. And then it's basically no and then else. Anything other than no. And what you wanted is a program that has three possibilities, yes, no, and other. And this is where elif statements come in. So if you were to change that to elif, you could indeed answer yes, and you'd only get one response. So the final little improvement that's going to turn our program into something that parses text with a little bit of accuracy is if we turn these into membership statements. Now, membership statements in Python look like this. Let me show you. If A and S in, sorry, if yes in answer. So now, now, check this out. Yes, I love them. Mm. It only checks if this is present, and it is. And here you could say if no in answer. And I can say no, I hate. Uh, don't worry about the spelling, sorry. So. Here you go. Uh, we are now handling longer answers that include the words yes and no. And we have this don't understand as a catch-all 
So this is a much, much, much better text parser. And we got there by adding only a couple of lines of code. And I think you get a bit of an insight by doing this, how difficult a job those guys that wrote Zork some 40 years ago would have had being able to handle all of these possible responses. Okay, what is next? Let me clear out the annotations. Clear all drawings. Um, hopefully when I refresh this, we're gonna be back. Ah, Sajad, sorry. What if it hasn't got yes or no? So Sajad, if it doesn't have yes or no, um, it will tell you I don't understand. Thanks for the question. Guys, I strongly encourage uh, asking questions. I'm going to try to get to all of you. You're attending a live webinar. And the advantage of that is actually being able to ask questions. So by all means, um, get into that. Okay. So next up, we have um, another thing that's going to make our chatbot a little bit more human. Um, so this goes a little bit beyond the basic parsing and it involves randomness. So instead of just asking, say, how are you? You could ask, how are you in a randomized way? So this is a list. It's a list of greetings. Hello, how are you? Greetings, young human. Tell me about your disposition. How are you doing? How's it going? What's up? And we are going to pick a random choice from these greetings. So we're gonna pick a random one. So if I say run, I don't know why this loads for a while. It's, it's like it's loading text blob, but we're not using text blob. It will actually print a different greeting every time, or it's gonna pick one at random. So you could have the same one appearing twice in a row, but generally speaking, about 80% chance it's a different one. And this is cool. So you can ask, you've already with, you know, these eight, nine lines of code, you can ask a human, how are you in a random way? And, you know, with students, I typically go back and then try to get them to write something that processes an answer to how are you and tries to handle all the different ways that a human can describe how they're feeling. However, the most effective way to do that is using a little bit of artificial intelligence or let's say a subdomain of artificial intelligence called natural language processing and sentiment analysis in specific. Um, so let's, let's actually just add it to this particular program and I'll explain what we're doing. So we're going to import a very specific function from text blob, from text blob, which is a Python module, we're going to import text blob. And then we're going to take an answer from the how are you question. So ans equals to input. And then we're going to say blob equals to text blob of the answer. By the way, um, this random choice, this is, we're gonna call this, um, how are you program? And I'm gonna put that in the chat so you will have it. So this blob here is an object that has polarity. It also has subjectivity, so you can check bias within the human answer. But I'm just going to print, oops, blob dot polarity. Now, this is interesting for so many reasons. Um, when we respond to this, how are you? I am doing great. You're gonna get a score between minus one and one uh, in terms of how positive or negative your sentiment or your feelings are. So great is 0 0.8. If we answer differently or had a longer answer, it would just sort of average it all out. So 
I am doing fine teaching some Python about sentiment analysis and having fun with it. That is 0.35. So it's you, the longer sort of the response, uh, the more accurate the sentiment reading. Now you're probably wondering how does this work? Well, you can Google uh, clips pattern sentiment analysis. So the, this particular function is borrowed from a Python module called pattern that comes from an institute called Eclipse. And what they did is used millions of Yelp reviews and analyzed adjectives in particular and associated them with a number of stars from those reviews. So Yelp's, they're, they're like restaurant reviews. And they have a score, a positive or negative score from minus one to one for every adjective in the English language. Now, Adjectives that have double meanings, for example, like check this out. If I say, I love them, or sorry, I like my state of mind. Like is a word that can be used in so many different ways. It's actually got zero polarity. So that's gonna be zero, zero. But I could say, I love, how I feel, that love is positive. So like is a term that has double meaning. So basically every adjective that doesn't have like a double meaning has a score and a lot of emotive nouns have scores and they're just all averaged out and that's how you get this polarity score. In terms of how accurate it is, it's about 85% accurate at predicting the number of stars reviews are gonna have and 85% accurate in sort of generally predicting uh, sentiment of reviews, but only about 75% accurate if it's given a sort of random task to recognize text. So if you go ahead and like try this program and try to use some irony, sarcasm, and, and sort of try to say something bad with only positive words, you could probably fool the algorithm. And, and that's a fun thing to do, by the way. Now, with this, we can easily create a... Um, a series of if elif elif el statements that handle five different levels of your response. So you could check if you're feeling super good, a little bit good, neutral, bad, and really bad. So let's go and try to do that. In fact, I'll print the polarity at the very end and we'll just say if blob dot polarity is greater than zero point five. So if this is greater than 0 0.5, we can print. I am glad you are doing fantastic. So that's really super positive. Um, on the next, you could say elif. In fact, you can just sort of, we'll paste stuff. If it's greater than 0.1, it's just positive. So you can just say, yeah, glad you are doing well. And then we can handle the negative, the hyper negative, because you definitely want to see the extreme case before the non-extreme case. So you want to see if it's less than negative 0.5, all right? And I could say, oh no, sorry to hear that. It's very empathetic, this chatbot. And if it is less than negative 0.1, then it's only a little bit bad. You can say something like, nah, you'll feel better soon. By the way, if you ever have this issue, because the apostrophe is treated like that, you could just use double quotes. And finally, well, if it's not really bad, bad, it's not really good or good, what's left? Neutral. 
So neutral is the else case. Well, print sounds like you're doing okay. So let's let's take a look at how this works. Greetings, human. Tell me about your disposition. Well, should we try neutral? I'll go neutral. I am a human being on planet Earth. So there's nothing, there's no emotive, there's no adjectives, there's no emotive nouns. This should be 0.0. .0. Yeah, sounds like you're doing okay. And then I'll do, let's say, an extremely positive and maybe a slightly negative case. Um, hello, how are you? I am doing... What if I said super fantastic? Ah, not hyper positive that, interesting. Um, what if I said, I am very happy. Ah, there you go. Very happy is very positive. And let's try some negative ones. Horribly bad. Oh no, sorry to hear that. What if I said horribly good? Hey, so horribly is actually um, how polarity is working. Explain again. Okay, so question again, how is this polarity working? Um, in a sentence, individual words have tags. Each word has a score of uh, between minus one and one. Most words have zero. The words that are tagged actively are adjectives. So like good, bad, great, horrible, lovely, cute, etc. All of these words have scores that are between minus one and one. And when you write a sentence, all of these scores add up to an overall score. I hope that makes sense. Um, the only catch is that um, some words are amplifiers. So for example, good might have a score, like good is 0.7, but very good should be higher, right? So same way bad is negative 0.7 pretty much, and very bad is a lot worse than that. Uh, how does Python recognize these words, databases? Yes, yes. So the pattern, if you search for clips pattern, um, that has a giant database of, of words. I think there's over 10,000 tagged words. So that's it. Um, that is, I suppose we could do one more little thing just as a print. Um, I could even do an if statement. So for example, if we say that, how we're feeling, uh, print subjectivity, comma, blob dot subjectivity. So this tells you about the level of bias in your writing. So for example, I am a human on planet earth is like sounds like your subjectivity is really low so like something that's got low subjectivity less than 0.5 um is very very objective sorry like the the subjectivity yeah it's 0.1 um but if you use a lot of adjectives i am feeling Subjectivity is high because you're using very emotional language. So while programming, we have to remember the numbers. No, 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 no. You don't have to remember anything. Uh, all of this calculation happens at the background. So all you need to know while programming is that 
scores of above zero are positive, below zero are negative. The closer to one, the more positive it is, the closer to minus one, the more negative it is. All of the actual calculations of, of polarity happen in the background. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I've enjoyed the number of questions I've had today, which is good. So now that we are here, um, I'm gonna show you two examples and maybe I'll send you guys a, a YouTube video um, on how to build a chat bot that puts everything we've done together. So this one is actually not gonna have any extra code. And I have a YouTube video um, that teaches you how to, to build this. So I'm gonna put that in the chat. And before we finish, I'll show you my latest chatbot that I'm going to be doing uh, more work on that actually includes the mood for the bot. It includes some biases and it also remembers people it has talked to. So just um, give me one second here as I pull off this link. So the video I'm about to show you, um, I'm not gonna show you a video, but the program that you're looking at has a YouTube tutorial associated with it. Um, and that's that. And you could basically build it step by step. It takes about 30 minutes. So you could do that in your own time after the workshop. And I'll show you what the chat but does. Okay, it's loading text bot, text blob. If anybody else wants to talk to the chat bot, you can just let me know in the chat and I'll like, I'll, I'll let you uh, tell it, tell me what to tell it. Uh, hello human, what's your name? Let's say I'm Bob and I don't have a nickname. I'll call you Bobby. How are you feeling? Great man, feeling fantastic. So that's there. So now it asks you opinion. Like you remember how we had random greetings. Um, not only is it integrating your nickname there, but now it's asking you questions and random topics. What's your take on computers? I think they are interesting. I don't know if interesting is a positive word. Well, you clearly like computers. What do you reckon about Melbourne? Home city. I love it. Uh, you clearly like Melbourne. What do you think about Python? Fantastic. Good talking to you, Bobby. I got to go now. So this is about 90 lines assembled entirely from the concepts you've just learned. If you want to know what this looks like at a more advanced level, um, we're going to do that right here, actually. Let's reload, oops. And I'll tell you what I've added to this one. It remembers what people think on each topic. It itself has a bias. It has its own opinion on each topic. And it remembers people it met and it assigns a score out of 10 onto how much you agree with it. It also has a mood. It's set inside this greeting file. So mood, mood is random. And it remembers the mood it was in after it got done talking to you. So basically, if you disagree with it a lot, it will end the conversation abruptly and be mean to you. And if you agree with it a lot, if you have similar opinions to the chatbot, it's gonna tell you how much it likes you. So in a, in a sense, it's, it's really like, it is more human-like uh, than most chatbots that are out there. And in terms of how complicated it is, I mean, you're looking at, that's 99 plus how big is this particular file? Yeah, 150 lines of Python can get you a pretty realistic chatbot. So take a look at this. Okay, what is your name? So same as before, we are gonna be Bob. Oh, it's you again. Oh, we so it remembered Bob. There's no more nicknames. Oh, there is a nickname. If I say no, it'll be call you Bobby. Are you well? Yes, I am doing great. 
Glad you're doing well. How do you feel about football? Now, it has an opinion that's fairly neutral about football. So if your opinion is actually fairly neutral or positive, then, um, every, then it'll be happy because your opinions are close. But if I say something very positive, football is fantastic. You clearly like football. I disagree, football is worse than that because that's his opinion. Most people I know think football is great. So it remembers what most people have said. What do you reckon about computer games? Um, so let's see, what can I, how can I make them? Computer games, computer games are fun. Oh, they, he thinks is better than that. Also, most people I know think computer games are great. Okay, I've had enough of your silly opinions. He goes. So as soon as your opinions don't agree with his, he's out. And if they do agree, he stays and talks to you longer and gives you a nice greeting. So there you go. That is an example of a more advanced chatbot. I'm going to send this into the links. And you can play around with that code. And that is that. So guys, now is probably a good time as any to drop in any questions about anything uh, you've learned. I've, most people stayed along for the whole presentation. That's absolutely fantastic. Maybe I'll show you uh, a little bit um, on the Head Start Academy, the com.au website. There is a page called Python Chatbot Resources. Right here, uh, you're going to get access to the programs that we used. There's a whole giant uh, AI chatbot unit that's basically sponsored by the Australian government that I created over the last Australian summer. It has extra built-in exercises. So that's like a giant free course that's free. It's linked from on that site. Um, I'm lagging. Well, yeah. Sorry, everyone. Um, yeah, and check out these videos. Uh, this is really a good one. Turing machine, uh, can machine, sorry, Turing test, can machines think? This, this is a question that I think uh, is, is going to be answered in our lifetimes. Um, we're either going to see advanced chatbots um, in the next 10 years or probably not at all. So here's the web link where all of that is available. Um, if you have any questions, drop them now. Otherwise, uh, we're going to begin to wrap up. The other thing in my website, there's a free members area. I strongly suggest you join because you're going to get access to full uh, online courses with links to programs. And if you join, you get to be a member of my mailing list and you're gonna get, again, every time I launch a course, members get free access to that. Okay. Um, that's all for now. Check the links in the description. We are going to wrap up in a minute if there aren't any questions. I hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. I hope you found this useful. Mm. Oh, and to the Zoom attendees, yeah, I just wanted to know how you implement Python codes, for example, mobile apps and web apps. Um, well, look, the easiest, this is as easy as it gets. Uh, this is doing it inside like the web browser using REPL. Um, but if you're trying to program a website to do this type of logic, I would say that JavaScript is probably a better language, um, but you need to have Python running on a server with files on that server. And then people, the server could run Python scripts and people could access the files to, to run them this way. So uh, for beginners, I strongly recommend either REPL or a website called Trinket, trinket.io. 
And if you're going to try to create apps, there's there's a um, a application called MIT App Inventor, and that mostly uses block coding, but that is the easiest way to get a mobile app running. Ah, another question. Does it chat well? Does deep learning help with chatbots AI? Well, absolutely. Um, this idea of computers becoming intelligent, literally like what makes humans more intelligent than other animals, we talk to each other. So we communicate complex ideas to each other. So this ability to put understanding and ideas into a language, which is then applied, is what intelligence is. So um, yeah, the research into deep learning and machine learning and natural language processing is pretty much going hand in hand. And so you'll see most of the applications in Python are either sort of open computer vision, either to deal dealing with processing pixels and trying to predict what they're going to do and what the pixels mean, sort of image and video processing or text processing. So basically those are the two key areas. I'm a front-end designer and I just want to add back into my website. So you go Python, PHP or Node.js. Well, I'm not a web developer. So I suggest you ask web developers that question. However, I can tell you if you learn Python as opposed to uh, PHP or Node.js, you're going to be able to apply that Python, to apply your Python knowledge in a hundred other domains. Whereas PHP and Node.js are very, very sort of specialized uh, languages for um, web development. So uh, if Python is even nearly as good, I would recommend you go with Python. So it doesn't even have to be as good for that to be a, a good recommendation. Cool. 602 guys. Ah, last question. Okay, we'll do one last question. How deep should I learn databases and analysis to deeply interact with chatbots, other AI-based applications? Um, no, you don't need to do to delve in that deep into uh, databases. Generally speaking, uh, if you do web development, you're probably familiar with JSON files, JSON. So with JSON files, you could store um, dictionaries and lists. And even to do a fairly intelligent chatbot, you wouldn't need to go beyond, say, two-dimensional lists. So um, no, I wouldn't even implement any advanced databases until, until this is going beyond the one person project. So I'd go with JSON files. All right. Ah, creating your own database. Yeah, well, uh, same answer. I mean, I'll just show you what it looks like on my end. So that is a dictionary for human opinions. That's a dictionary for people and how much they're liked. Um, in a more advanced version, it would be a dictionary with a list and answer to every single question that that human got asked. And then you could process that more deeply. Awesome, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Um, let's call this a wrap. Uh, good luck and have fun with whatever you're doing. Uh, I am off to have dinner with my wife and my parents. So yeah, thank you and bye-bye.